I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So last week I talked about why do we take in the good? In other words, why do we encourage, open to, use skillful means to develop ourselves, to grow, to heal, uh, to cultivate wholesome qualities of mind and heart? Why do we do that? And I mentioned four major reasons, which I also mentioned in our informal start here. One, we take in the good, we internalize beneficial experiences and states of being, in other words. We do that to grow strengths inside, to enrich ourselves from the inside out in a very healthy way so we can function better and be happy and have more to offer to others. One. Two, we take in the good to heal ourselves. Three, we take in the good because as we internalize the good, the underlying basis for craving, the sense of something missing or something wrong, gradually falls away. And last, we take in the good most fundamentally because it draws us increasingly into a sense of abiding in reality as a whole, which is inherently good in its bountiful, emergent generosity. So now I want to apply those general principles of taking in the good to taking in or developing each of the seven factors of awakening in the Buddhist tradition. These are pragmatic, psychological factors. There's nothing woo-woo or metaphysical or, you know, like woo out there about them. Uh, I'll name them. I'll, I will name them in a moment, and then we will begin our process of focusing on them one by one with the first one. So the seven factors um, are listed in different ways, but I'll go through them in a certain order. Uh, that has a certain sense to it, are mindfulness, investigation, and these are English translations of traditional words. You can maybe use other words if you like, but mindfulness, investigation, energy, and then a word that has multiple translations of bliss or rapture or joy. Number four, Tranquility, number five. Number six, concentration, particularly not in the sense of, you know, pouring over a crossword puzzle or, you know, trying to get a thread through the eye of a needle concentration, but more like a samadhi, a deep sense of um, non-ordinary experiences, particularly when they're fully concentrated in you. And then number seven, equanimity. So those are the seven. Mindfulness, investigation, energy, um, bliss, rapture, or joy, then tranquility, equanimity, pardon me, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. Uh, these are factors of awakening. And what's interesting is that the um, word for them involves the word for Buddha nature, and a factor or cause. So we can actually explore the, the sense that in the moment of mindfulness, in the moment of investigating, in the moment of tranquility, in the moment of equanimity and so forth, there is awakening already. There is Buddha nature already in, in the presence of that factor or quality in your own experience at the time. That's kind of a sweet way to think about it, right? Not just that these factors will lead you on, but that in the factors intrinsically are qualities of awakened consciousness already. Oh, pretty good. So a few words about them. One is that you'll notice what's left out. <laughs> Lots left out. Uh, love is left out. There's nothing in these seven that's explicitly pro-social. 
you get more the dimension of lovingness, relationality, uh, moral treatment of others in other lists in the Buddhist tradition, like the three pillars of practice being sila, samadhi, and panya, um, sila being moral conduct, virtuous conduct, often with a quality of restraint, uh, samadhi, concentration, mental training, the concentration inside yourself, like of a fine sauce of wonderful qualities, and then panya, wisdom, insight, uh, wise view, uh, deep wisdom about the nature of everything. Uh, so you find you know the the moral dimension there, and also in the so-called Brahma Viharas, uh, the <clears throat> resting places, the dwelling places uh, of awakening, of compassion, kindness, uh, a generous goodwill toward others, a happiness for them, an altruistic joy, and equanimity again in that list as well of the Brahma Viharas. You find more of those heartfelt qualities there, and you find a number of teachings in early Buddhism that make it really quite clear that the full development of the heart um, is a sufficient path of awakening uh, that naturally cultivates um, insight and um, a, a sense of oneness with everything in, it, in its very nature. So you find heartfeltness, relationality, uh, um, kindness and compassion and so forth elsewhere, but they're not in this list. So just acknowledging that, then we'll go back to the list. A second comment about these, this list uh, is that uh, it's taught, the Buddha taught at one point, that of the seven, mindfulness is, is really to be present under all conditions. It's, it's very foundational. Without mindfulness, how do we make use of the other six? Also, if you're feeling particularly uh, lethargic, uh, if you're uh, experiencing the hindrance or the covering of, translated sometimes, of sloth and torpor, you just, you know, <laughs> you're just not that into it, you know, like practice schmack does. Um, the Buddha recommends three of the seven factors of awakening in particular, investigation, energy, and uh, joy. Uh, good. On the other hand, if you're really overly excited, maybe uh, dealing with the hindrance or the covering of your own true nature, the root of the word for hindrance is a covering of your true nature, or it, or it hinders your own expression of true nature. Uh, if you're feeling uh, restless and worried, restlessness and worry, for example, you're agitated about something, well then, the three factors of the seven that are more about cooling and calming are really appropriate here. Tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, I'll say that there's a kind of natural sequence uh, <clears throat> of the seven. Uh, mindfulness is a necessary or it's a an, an enabling condition, an encouraging condition of investigation. Uh, investigation somehow maybe <laughs> opens up energy. You, know, you release things as you investigate them. There's some truth to that. As a clinical psychologist, I can say. So as this energy then is released, it can move into, um, in Pali, piti, rapture, bliss, a joyfulness, which has an intensity to it. Um, often with an arising quality, um, even a, a very blissful quality in the body. Um, there are teachings that we should cultivate the factor of, of I tend to translate it myself as bliss because it's so physical, uh, using the metaphor of someone who takes bath powder, some kind of soapy powder that was used 2,500 years ago, this dry powder, and mingle water in it so that the moisture of the water pervades the powder thoroughly, turning it into, I guess, some kind of dough-like substance. In much the same way, uh, the teaching is that we should encourage this rapture, this bliss, this whew, joy, which I have definitely experienced multiple times in practice, including on retreat very intensely, um, to fill our body. When I get to that one, uh, I'll explore with you why in the world 
with a tradition that values renunciation and is rooted historically in a lot of asceticism, which the and you know restraint of the body, that the Buddha turned away from to some extent, but still in his own monastic practice and life, lived a very abstemious, a very renunciate, a very disengaged from sense pleasure kind of life. Wow, why would there be such a valuing of bliss? So I'll be getting to that, even neurologically. Stay tuned. So here we have this overview, the seven factors of awakening. I find them to be really useful, really useful. Uh, also, too, as a way of kind of self-diagnosis. Where are you at? Self-assessment. That's a better word. Uh, what's strong in your case? What do you have going pretty readily for you? And what uh -huh, could use some, some appreciating? Uh, how stable is your mindfulness? How active is your real-time uh, vipassana, your real-time investigation of the granularity of your experiences? Granularity in terms of both time and the various spaces of experience, kinds of experience you're having. Investigation. Um, a lot of the therapeutic journey, you know, speaking from my own background, uh, is about investigating, curiosity, um, Joseph Goldstein was once asked, you know, in his long life of serious practice, a major American Dharma teacher, Buddhist teacher, what had he found to be some of the most important qualities and factors to cultivate? He answered, curiosity. Curiosity. So investigation. Maybe that's something to develop more. No matter how immobilized we are by our circumstances or the intensity of our pain in the moment, we can always engage in investigation. You know, I've actually heard it said that of the seven factors, investigation is arguably the most important because it's, it's the midwife, it's heuristic, uh, it's the catalyst, it's catalytic for the rest of them. You could also ask yourself, oh, am I energetic? You know, or honestly, am I wakefulness? Uh, am I kind of phoning it in? <laughs> Have I hit a plateau? Am I at an intermediate stage that's, in, that's good, definitely better than how neurotic I used to be, speaking personally? Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, could I use some energy for my practice? Energy leading to diligence, energy leading to a heartfeltness. Um, there's a recurring uh, phrase that I think about that a sincere practitioner is one who is ardent, heartfelt energetic and resolute and diligent and mindful, ardent, you know, energy. How's that for you? And what would support your energy? You know, would it just support your life to live a little bit of a different life? Maybe to, you know, give up that last hour of TV or, you know, social media surfing on your phone and get to bed and get an extra hour of sleep. Try that for a couple of weeks in a row and check out your energy level then. Maybe better. Um, so, you know, looking at diet, looking at food, looking at exercise, looking at conditions, what, what supports your energy? And then tranquility. I also heard Joseph uh, Goldstein really value the quality of tranquility. Not tranquility as in numbing or apathy or suppressing. Uh, <clears throat> and even tranquility is deeper than relaxation. Tranquility as a kind of um, stillness, a quieting of the mind, a quieting of the mind and a tranquility in the body. When we're tranquil, there's, you know, I, I get a daily um, um, teaching uh, in my email inbox every day from Pari Yati, which I highly recommend, P-A-R-I-Y-A-T-T-I. -T -T um, and the one today had to do with uh, someone who has really re relinquished and released is uh, as still as a mountain pond. Stillness, tranquility, really, really valuable tranquility. And in tranquility, we're much more able to do what we explored, especially toward the end of the meditation, to rest in the present, not with no gaining mind, as they say in Zen. We're tranquil. We don't, we're not trying to gain anything nor are we resisting anything. We're tranquil. There's a tranquility. Okay. 
peacefulness, or peaceful, tranquil. Really interesting to cultivate. And it often, the way it shows up, is you'll experience that there's a tranquility or there's a level in your being that is tranquil. On the surface of which, higher up, it's agitated. I've had many experiences where my mind felt like on the surface a stormy sea, but just like being underwater, if you've been 10 or 20 feet underwater, you know, comfortably, it's quieter there, isn't it? You know, the storm could be raging above you, but 20 feet down, you're not moving that much. It's tranquil. So how about tranquility in your own life? Could you make room for it? Could you dis disengage from things that are agitating? Um, <clears throat> my wife and I watched the first episode of The Last of Us, kind of a zombie movie, post-apocalyptic, fungi-caused zombiness. And uh, we watched it shortly before bed. <laughs> Not a good idea <laughs> in promoting tranquility. So what helps you be tranquil? And then uh, concentration. There's really a place for, if you're kind of serious about practice, uh, training your mind into a deep quality of steadiness and absorption and exploring even the jhanas, the right concentration element of the Eightfold Path, to really, really, really deepen um, your concentration and, and to bring that aspect of training and purification of your mind. You might explore that. And for many, many people, um, and definitely for me, that's where your practice will take off. Now, when I look back at my own history, uh, my practice really took off kind of in, I would say, on a foundation of a kind of casual meditativeness and interest in uh, Buddhist teachings and, you know, self-awareness in, in real time. One <clears throat> was when Christina Feldman, a root teacher for me, uh, said to a small group I was in, what about concentration practices? which most of us had just left out. Look for teachers like um, Stephen Snyder, Tina Rasmussen, Lee Brasington, Shyla Catherine, uh, Richard Shankman, and others who really focus on you know, classic trainings, uh, following tra teachings of like Paul Oxidow, uh, classic trainings of concentration, really valuable. A second thing, that was a major turbocharger for me later on, following after that, was appreciating the value of emotionally positive experiences, the value for practice, the ways in which bliss is a factor of awakening, the ways in which um, happiness, contentment, um, uh, are is a factor of meditative absorption, really appreciating those positive qualities and, and not turning away from them, emotionally positive, enjoyable, even intensely enjoyable experiences as not objects of craving, but rather vehicles of releasing craving. And then third for me, um, love. Love and the generosity that comes with it uh, is a major, major piece of the puzzle. And then I guess I'll, since I'm being painfully candid, maybe not painfully, uh, the last one, especially turbocharged uh, from in Mahayana influences, including those of Henry Schuckman, who was a guest teacher a couple of weeks ago, um, opening into everything, you know, kind of a growing, abiding, with a sense of abiding in and as the ground of all as a major piece of practice. So anyway, those have been four steps for me, and, and along them, definitely the first of them uh, was around concentration. And then last in the seven factors, equanimity. Equanimity is deeper than relaxation or tranquility. In tranquility, we're not having any reactions to speak of. In equanimity, we're not reacting to our reactions. Equanimity is underneath it all. Uh, reactions come and go. The worldly winds per come and go. Pain and pleasure, right? Loss and gain. Um, blame and... Um, Fame and ill repute, ill repute and fame, um, praise and blame and praise. Anyway, they come and they go. Equanimity is being undisturbed in the present underneath it all. That's a cultivation as well. So somebody asked me, <clears throat> yes, you can think of these seven sequentially. I tend to think of them, actually, they're all 
uh, available to us. Uh, we draw on one. And, you know, there is a kind of a building process moving toward a profound equanimity. All right. Um, I'll just name concentration teachers again. It'll be in the recording, and I'm, this is off the top of my head, but these are people I've learned from. Steven Snyder, Tina Rasmussen, Lee Brasington, Shyla Catherine, Richard Shankman. In the tradition of um, early Buddhism, um, the Theravadan tradition, uh, these are the Vipassana tradition. These stand out to me, and there are others as well. Um, and then concentration practices, uh, I would say things like really focusing on a single object of attention and staying with it uh, can help. And when I get to concentration, you know, later on, I'll talk more about that. Okay. So now the first of these, mindfulness. Mindfulness is all the rage, right? It's on Time Magazine. Uh, Sports coaches, MBA coaches, and others, which I'm fine with, are teaching mindfulness. Uh, secular mindfulness, uh, championed uh, very much by John Kabat-Zinn, who's a historic figure who's made historic contributions to mental health and and broadly stated, um, and others certainly have you know developed trainings in mindfulness. It's all around us. What I'd like to do is kind of try to push through the familiar understanding of mindfulness and approach it more with beginner's mind, beginner's mind, don't know mind, with a, with a freshness here. So that said, um, <clears throat> people these days often have a fairly elastic <laughs> definition of mindfulness that encompasses all kinds of positive, wonderful, beneficial things, but I'm kind of rooted in a more of a psychological, I guess, tradition of construct validity <laughs> and a certain precision and differentiating constructs or factors from other things. You'll note that in the seven factors of awakening, mindfulness is differentiated from things like investigation. Um, mindfulness, uh, sati in Pali, is differentiated from vipassana, which is insight. Uh, so mindfulness, to me, and, and I think this is the sense of it in, in early Buddhism, is simply sustained present moment awareness. There's a stability of present moment awareness of both the outer and the inner world. In that stability of present moment awareness, uh, various things may move through. There could be a focusing of attention on a particular thing but there can be a stability of present moment awareness of attention coalescing around a particular thing. And if we become really captured by that particular thing, really caught up in it, uh, there can also be a return to that stability of, of presence uh, in which whatever we've been attending to is there, but it's in a field or in a space. It's in a ground in a container, if you will, of kind of a stability of present moment awareness. Mindfulness itself is morally neutral. And I, again, I'm, I'm trying to be, I'm being consistent with early Buddhism. Mindfulness itself is morally neutral. A burglar can be mindful, a sniper can be mindful. Um, mindfulness is neutral. Alongside mindfulness can be other factors, such as um, wise view, wise intention, wise action, wise speech, compassion, heartfeltness, tranquility, bliss. Alongside mindfulness can be other things. Other things occurring or being blended in the streaming of consciousness, rippling alongside the ripples of mindfulness, that does not take away from mindfulness. There's a misunderstanding that's often present that if we're being mindful, we're not also allowed to make wise efforts. That's not the Buddha's teaching. It's not common sense either. Now, it is true that there are certain meditative practices in which little, if anything, besides mindfulness is present. We did some of those 
today in the meditation. Um, you can practice to a place where you're just mindful in a choiceless, undisturbed, stable kind of way. Great. But just because only mindfulness is present there doesn't mean that that's the only way to be mindful. We need to be mindful while we're doing the dishes, while we're arguing with our partner or trying not to argue with our partner. Uh, we need to be mindful while we're doing emails, which is a major failure of mine <laughs> or growing as a practice. Try to be mindful while you're engaging language in a focused way. You know? uh, try to be mindful <laughs> while you're trying to make your point to somebody. That's a challenge. We're to be mindful under all these conditions. So how do we do it? It's easy to be mindful for half a breath. It's easy to be mindful when everything around you is calm and you're calm inside, all right? Um, but how to be mindful the rest of the time? So I'm gonna offer a few perspectives here and then see if we can open it up for discussion about your challenges with sustaining mindfulness and some things that might help you. This will not be an exhaustive list of things that can be helpful. Um, I have definitely found them to be helpful for myself. And you can think of them a little bit as like a pre-flight checklist. And as I go through them, you can go, oh, got that. Yeah, pretty good there. Whoa, room for improvement here. Oh, got it there, got it there, got it there. So you can use this to kind of identify what might be helpful to you. All right? Okay. So I think a way of looking at mindfulness is as a combination of three things. There is presence, right? It's a wholehearted, embodied attentiveness. We're present. With a spaciousness that is inclusive, open, and non-preferring. There could be preferring alongside the mindfulness, but in mindfulness itself, it it's not, pref it's not preferential. It's not liking or disliking. Liking or disliking is something we can be mindful of, but it's mindfulness itself uh, does not like or dislike. Mindfulness itself is inclusive and open, even welcoming. So that's the second quality. So we have first presence. There's a wholehearted, embodied attentiveness. There's a spaciousness, and there's a quality of recollectedness. The root of the word for sati, which is translated as mindfulness, sati in Pali, is memory. We're recollected. There's a, there's a kind of a recursive quality in mindfulness. It, um, there's a kind of reverber reverberative quality as we sustain a recollectedness rather than getting distracted or lost in thought. There are aspects of mindfulness that are metacognitive. We can be mindful of being mindful, which helps us remain mindful, okay? These might be ways of relating to mindfulness that are maybe fresh for you uh, or you know, meaningful for you. Uh, presence, whew, you're here. Plop, you're present. Spacious, you're open, you're inclusive, you're not picking and choosing. In the Zen saying, nothing left out in the field of your mindfulness. And there's a, a recollectedness, there's a, there's a persistence of your mindfulness. These are ways into aspects of mindfulness that you can feel and cultivate. Neurologically, Sustained mindfulness tends to begin with deliberate top-down executive control that draws on and activates regions typically in the frontal portions of the brain um, uh, that are and that, that also involve the anterior or frontal cingulate cortex, which is a part of the brain. Technically, there are two of them, one on either side of the brain. The cingulate cortex, the frontal portion, is a kind of monitor of uh, whether we're staying on target. And it sends out a kind of an alert message 
uh, if we've wandered away. And so the stability of this kind of top-down applying and deliberately sustaining of attention is where we begin as we cultivate the trait of mindfulness. And you may recall that in meditative instructions, I talked about applying and sustaining attention. What's interesting, <clears throat> and you may well be experiencing it already, is that people who are relatively practiced in mindfulness have increasingly a, a kind of fading or easing of that top-down directing. And the stability of presence is more a matter of bottom-up uh, abiding. And neurologically, what's interesting is that when people first start to meditate, let's say, one way I would put it is that executive regions of sustained attention aren't very active. And then in the middle or intermediate stage of meditating, uh, let's say, or the cultivation of mindfulness, uh, the executive regions become a lot more active. In the third stage, and this is you see this in people who have been meditating for a, quite a long time and who can just drop in to being present within a few breaths and then be basically present for, you know, 80% or more of the seconds in a 35-minute set, that's pretty good. Even 90%, you know, you're, you're there most of the time. Um, activity in these neurological regions like the anterior cingulate cortex, these top-down executive systems, activity there tends to diminish. Isn't that interesting? Because experienced meditators are just more plop, dropped in. Uh, so it's okay to start out drawing on those executive regions, but over time, you become increasingly plopped in. Uh, I want to name a couple of factors to draw your attention to and then uh, present a cool bit of neurology and then open it up for questions. And uh, I'm just going to, uh, yeah, okay, great. So um, what makes us not mindful? One is temperament, and there's a normal temperamental range. Some people are just naturally more distractible. And the hunter-gatherer bands in which we evolved needed all types. Uh, they needed members of the band who were more capable of being <whistles> alerted to the new thing or more capable of being um, you know, alerted to what might be arising inside themselves. It's, right? it's hard to sustain mindful attention to one particular thing if you experience stimulation hunger. If your brain naturally, actually there's a kind of stimostat, stimulation, you know, thermostat in your basal ganglia. And some people just need more stimulation to be able to stay present. Uh, if you're a dopamine depleter, what I mean by that is that there's a natural genetic variation in which some people express a lot of receptors for dopamine in their brain and other people don't produce that many receptors. Well, if you have a lot of receptors, I probably do, uh, you don't need a lot of reward or a lot of novelty or a lot of stimulation to stay present because you have a lot of receptors. Uh, you're not depleting dopamine quickly. Uh, other people, if you don't have very many receptors, you need a lot of fresh surges of dopamine to stay focused. It's not your fault. It's, it's a natural variation. So taking your temperament into account is really useful. And that's why it can paradoxically be helpful to bring in a kind of rich background of stimuli, including emotionally satisfying stimuli, stimuli like lovingness or the sense of enjoyab enjoyableness, taking in the good, right? Um, and when that background is present, then you can stay more uh, mindful because your stimulation hunger is being satisfied. I had a, uh, a client uh, once, a, a boy who was on the autism spectrum and would not, could not settle as an infant. And finally, um, his very clever mother, at about six months of age, put a television set in his bedroom and left it on all the time. Now, she turned it to Nickelodeon. <laughs> it wasn't on like the war channel or the horror movie channel, but she just left it on. And then the kid could sleep 
because he needed that stimulation background to settle. So take into account your temperament. And then the last thing I'll, I'll just say about this is that we tend to lose st stable presence in the present when craving takes over, when we feel like something is missing or something is wrong. It's hard to just be stably present if you're agitated about something, if you're dejected about something or longing for something. These are two words that are used um, to, to pay attention to and, and to release as best you can. So the cultivation of the sense of enoughness already, the cultivation of the sense of all rightness already, the cultivation of the sense of warm heartedness already. All of these things help the scared animal of the body feel okay enough to just rest in the present mindfully. So attention to the object of objective conditions that threaten your or challenge your safety, your satisfaction, your connection is really important, including intervening through activism in society, really important. And meanwhile, to really pay attention to the engine of craving inside your own mind and marked by feelings of pressure or insistence, compulsion, mustness, drivenness, um, contraction, the sense of stress, Emo negative emotions are markers, typically, and motivators of craving. You know, not to fight them, but to notice them and investigate them, as it were. So the cultivation of a fullness in the present is a major factor of mindfulness. And then last, a bit of cool neurology, I'll try to say this very quickly, uh, <clears throat> is that we have different attentional systems that have evolved over time. The most fundamental attentional system is called alerting. It's the kind of right at the front edge of now, you know, if the consciousness is like a windshield. It's the front edge of the windshield as time moves through you or you move through time, alerting. Something has happened, something has changed, something. It's, it's the immediacy of the first half second or so of the processing stream, followed by other attentional systems that orient, orient, to what has happened, where is it, and what is it? And then other attentional systems, a third attentional system starts mobilizing around how is it personally relevant, which moves quickly into what should I do about it? These three aspects of our attentional systems are really useful for you know, ancient crab-like ancestors, let alone our lizard or mammalian or hominid or human ancestors, right? Well, as practice matures and we become more and more at ease in the present, comprehending it and, and okay with it, we become more and more able to simply rest in alerting. We're just here. Things are happening. Things are happening. Impermanence. Endless arising, endless arising. And we're just rested at the front edge of the windshield of consciousness. And that's kind of the quintessence of mindfulness. And with practice, you can just know what it's like increasingly to hang out in, in, in that alerting state. It, you're still functional. You're still functional. But mainly you're just like, oh, wow. The new, the endless new. The, end, the endless new of the endless now. Huh. Huh. And that's really interesting to explore. I really explore it in the nowness section of the seven aspects of neurodharma in my book and the online program that's just starting now, I think, if you can maybe still hop on board. Um, nowness. Okay. So that's, that's good on mindfulness. Lots of people have lots of other good things about it. They've written whole books about mindfulness. Uh, I'll leave it there for now. All right, so I want to call on Farah and Jed. You've been kind, and um, so I'm going to ask you to unmute, and I'm going to try to make you know sure this is useful for a general audience, and that we have time for Jed, you know, as well before we finish close to 7:30. All right, Farah. 
Uh, thank you so much. I truly appreciate it. And I love your teaching. I love your generosity oh, altogether. You. Uh, I just came back from the Vipassana Meditation Center, uh, uh, led by Goinka. Okay. And, and it, it was very interesting. But uh, the question that I have from a Buddhist therapist is, uh, so... I'm a therapist, so I know that when uh, insight comes and when I see the repetition of certain things, it's coming constant sensation in my body, repetition of certain kind of thoughts, trauma, background, whatever. In Vipassana, what they're saying is don't pay attention to the thoughts and feelings, mm -hmm. just pay attention to the sensation on the body. So, sensation mm -hmm. be of the you know, uh, impermanence of it comes and goes. It's yeah. Beautiful. But what if you are constantly see the same repetition of same thing, which what mm -hmm. we call a trauma, it comes on and on. Oh, yeah. What they saying is, if you, so my question from them also was that, are we able to tap into the healing that part and then move on? They said it might cause craving. So it's very confusing for me. Is that got it? Crazy? Yeah. Can I let me? That's great. Yeah, you're you're naming a very fundamental um, and uh, issue that that comes up. And I and can I ask my second question? So maybe it's, you can come. I can I just I better focus on just the first one and then get to Jed because your first one is really big. Far it's just great. So first off, uh, Goenka is a fantastic teacher, and that lineage is fantastic, and. A technical procedure on a meditation retreat should not become a dogma, an ideology, or a way of life. It's a technical procedure that's skillful means in that setting as a means to an end, right? But it's uh, not to be a way of life to the exclusion of everything else. Think of all the other elements of the Eightfold Path that are left out in that approach, that single approach of basically just bear witnessing, especially of sensations. Right? There's so much more to practice than just that. Now, that's a wonderful practice, but it should not be the whole of the path. Right there. Right there. Now, that practice can actually take us uh, into very deep insight. Uh, and into the nature of all experiences by just staying on the sensations, breath after breath, hour after hour, day after day, right? You know, it does a lot to you in good ways. You can, you know, you know those things. Uh, it can really teach us that all, all experiences have the nature of emptiness. They are made of parts that are connected and changing and uh, without an owner or an identity that's intrinsic, intrinsic. Okay, that can be very liberating because then you can generalize from that to all experiences. Okay, great. Um, but I just think that uh, the Buddha offered a whole basket of skillful means. Why not use all the tools, right? And in the last 2,500 years, we've learned some things, right? In, including in other traditions that are skillful means. Why not use the whole kit and caboodle? of you know the toolbox that would be my view and then decide for yourself pragmatically what helps you know yeah is that okay i think that would be good perfect okay. thank you yeah and then go forward go forward and then see what's useful for you and uh, i think uh the idea here too you see this to me mistaken view that somehow engaging wise effort in the mind which includes promoting wholesome positive enjoyable factors right is somehow craving well, yeah, you can crave tranquility. It's kind of hard to. You know, you can crave concentration. You can crave equanimity. But no, 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 no. You can crave it if you want to. Just don't do it. Don't crave it. On the other hand, actually, as we cultivate these qualities, craving falls away. You can observe that directly. That's the Buddha's teaching. He says, cultivate tranquility. Cultivate joy. Cultivate love, cultivate gladness in your goodness, cultivate enjoyments and the happiness visible in this present life, right? These are good things. And watch what happens when we actually internalize these experiences. 
craving falls away. I just think there's some serious BS. No, not you that has slipped in to Western Buddhism uh, in the last 50 years. One is that mindfulness is king and nothing else matters. That's just a big wrong. <laughs> and then second, that it's not okay to engage wise efforts in your own mind. Like, what? Okay, that's me. See for yourself. Okay, thanks a lot, Farah. All right, Jed, thank you. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Thanks, everybody's hanging, whoops. You moved around. I have to. Okay, I have to. The you're now. You can ask your to un, you unmute yourself, Jed. Great. Yay. Okay. I got a, a a quick question on on just some basic practice. Um, all the mindfulness teachers that I've ever heard, they at some point will talk about um, counting the breaths as a way to yeah distract the method. monkey in the mind. You know. Um, I recently bought some mala beads and the idea behind those is instead of counting you just you have a tactile bead between your fingers and you go each breath you go to another bead so yeah. it just kind of replaces the idea of counting inside your head with something that you're touching and, and holding yeah in. just wondering how, how what are your thoughts on that uh, my first thought is that the traditional practices that have, um, um, it's kind of like survival of the, uh, of the most effective, right? And uh, there's this thing, survival of the fittest, survival of the kindest. Well, there's, in, in, the to in, in all the traditions, the techniques that survive over time and there are selection pressures on techniques methods, tools, are the ones that really work, at least for a significant number of people. And we can learn a lot from that. We can also bring to bear our modern neuropsychological understanding of things to just you know deepen our understanding of the why and sometimes even ways to refine the how, right? Clearly, in many, many traditions, people work with you know tactile practices, uh, including like a rosary, in the Christian tradition, uh, you know, or a mala, let's say, or doing other kinds of things that are tactile. I remember reading a very interesting and provocative um, uh, thesis from a psychologist who, who pointed out that, you know, the rise of depression in the West, in, in affluent countries like America, even though the standard of living is rising, even if Middle class incomes are stagnant, relative, you know, relative, but still the standard of living with technology and medical care and other things, you know, tends to be rising over time. Depression is rising as well. What? And he pointed out that in gener one or two or three generations ago, people routinely did more handwork. You know, they did their laundry by hand, they did their dishes by hand, they were very involved in crafts. A lot of work was by hand, including like with animals on farms, you did stuff by hand. My dad grew up on a ranch in North Dakota. He did a lot with his hands, you know, mending things. And so there's something about using our hands and maybe if we use our hands more, we'll be less depressed, which I find really quite interesting and encouraging for people to explore crafts and handwork of different kinds, um, you know, needlepoint, macrame, things like that, knitting and so forth, sewing. My wife sewed her wedding dress, pretty good. Okay, um, where was I? So my point is, um, I think these practices are helpful. And if you can use them as, a, as an absorption practice even, if there's something about the fingers touching the tactile surfaces, if there's something that's sacred, like people might have a mala with 108 beads and they'll recite a verse or they'll, they'll name something, you know? If that's meaningful to you, great. Uh, there's a kind of humility in it. It's not a full prostration, but there's something humble about you know moving through the mala. Fantastic. But then to finish here, ultimately, of course, it's a question of the raft. And you know, Jed, because you're deeply practiced, right? Uh, we use our practices for the sake of the heartwood. Ultimately, you know, full awakening, full stability of enlightenment. Um, we start to have more and more moments of awakening, as it were. And then we ask ourselves at some point, are our practices um, 
continuing to be launch pads for us? Or are we getting stuck to the launch pad? Are we stuck to the raft? Or and we, have we crossed over? And then we can start to explore sometimes letting go of the scaffolding of our practice, of various kinds of scaffolding for it. Maybe the building can stand in its own right. And then we explore that territory. Not because there's anything wrong or less um, <clears throat> than um, you know the practices we've been using, such as beads. Uh, they're not a lesser vehicle, right? I think there's this kind of sneering quality that has also crept into Buddhism over the centuries in which you know certain things are considered lesser. You know, hina yana compared to mahayana, hina is lesser, the lesser vehicle, right? Uh, that was a kind of, you know, dismissiveness re related to early Buddhism. So I'm not saying at all that mala practices are lesser or anything like that. I'm just saying, you know, it's an interesting exploration. So that's what I would say about all that, right? Someone points out that His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, usually has his beads in his hand when he talks. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. Hey, thank you. Yeah. 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 Great. 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 Okay. Well, <sighs> factors of awakening. In your case. Mindfulness is foundational. Mindfulness as presence, spaciousness, and recollectedness. That becomes increasingly stabilized, increasingly broad, becomes your foundation. And over time, you start more and more just hanging out with the emergence of the eternal presence. Present, endlessly alerted by the newness of nowness. <laughs>